we had an amazing day together. You saw when you came in, I hope, in your handout, there's a bio of our special guests tonight, Haley and Mia, and you can learn a little bit more about them. But more importantly, you're going to get to know them a little bit as we chat. But it was, it was quite a morning, and people who live in this city, and especially native Los Angelinos, will, I think, have a lot of respect for the uh, mileage that we put on this morning. We, um, I picked them up at their hotel at 7 a.m., and they uh, had just gotten in last night. They had a five-hour delay in Pittsburgh, which is a great way to start any vacation, by the way. <laughs> um, mechanical delay. And then let's move up a little bit closer so people can see you in the light. I know it's a little hard on the sides, and we'll try to move back so you can see them, but I want to make sure that we have enough light on your faces. Um, so 7 a.m., picked you up. We went all the way to Shalhevet High School, which is in Fairfax. Great time of the day to get down there. And we were welcomed with open arms by uh, the students at Shalhevet. Um, there was a lot of media there today, some of which we weren't expecting. There was three television trucks and radio and the Los Angeles Times. And Haley and Mia told a little, little bit of their story and answered some questions. And then we jumped in the car and we drove to West Hills, because that's what you'd want to do. We drove to D Toledo High School, and Haley and Mia were greeted by the entire uh, student body of D Toledo. Uh, about 400 students, and um, had an opportunity to answer some questions. And then we drove to Milken Community Schools so that they could have an opportunity to meet with students there. And then yesterday we got um, um, an email from CNN, and they wanted to know if we would go to the CNN building uh, at Universal City um, for the Michaela show and uh, be on uh, CNN. And so we said, of course, what could be more convenient? So we, we, drove, <laughs> to, um, we drove to Hollywood, and then, uh, then you got a little bit of downtime back at the hotel, and here you are at Stephen Wise Temple. And tomorrow, they're going to get up bright and early, and they're going to go on the bus from Stephen Wise at 8 o'clock. The bus is full, but if you want to join us, you can caravan. You can come and carpool and caravan. We'll be leaving about 8.15 going down to the march, and um, Rabbis uh, Laufer and Stern will be accompanying um, our, our esteemed delegates along with uh, lots of other folks, and they're going to have an opportunity to be introduced by Mayor Garcetti and uh, speak at the march. So it was quite a day, and I have to say I was, I was incredibly inspired by being with them. And uh, we decided after talking a little bit about the prepared remarks that, um, that the, the students had shared today that we'd, we'd have a conversation tonight so you could really get to know them a little bit better. So um, Haley and Mia, I'm so grateful to you for being here with us. And I'm grateful to um, Rabbi Melissa for bringing you and for, um, for your words that you shared today. I know you touched the lives of a lot of the teenagers in our community Literally over a thousand people were with you today, and then there were lots of other folks who got to um, see you on television and, and hear you on the radio. Um, Haley, I want to ask you to go back to February 14th and tell us about the day, and especially um, about what happened in the in the mid afternoon and following. So take us through that day a little bit. Um, well, first it was like a normal day. It was Valentine's Day, so everyone was happy and. At my school, it's really big, Valentine's Day. Everybody carries around like huge stuffed animals and a lot of candy. And then second period, we actually had a fire drill. And then the, day, the rest of the day was normal. And then at about 2.20, we had another fire drill. And it was a little weird because we're not used to that. Like there's usually just one a month. And then, um, so we were all, my class all went outside. And then we started seeing a bunch of kids like run from the other direction, telling us to run and evacuate. But nobody really did anything because we thought it was just like a drill because they were preparing us for one for a while. And then the teachers didn't know either. So they just, nobody was doing anything. And then we just started walking a little bit towards the middle school next door. And then one of the teachers found out that it wasn't a drill and told us that like we have to get out. So then we had to run like single file in between a fence and a lake with like this much room to run because there's no other way to get through anywhere. And then once we got out of there, they didn't know what to do with us because they didn't really know what was happening in the school besides that it was bad. So then I ran to my house because I live right there with my friend. And then we watched like the TV the whole time and all my friends are still in closets, like locked everywhere. So I was texting each of them, like going through like a list to make sure I got all their names and they were all okay. And then um, some of them were like texting me that they're scared and they don't know what's going on 
And I just made, told them, like, don't move unless the SWAT team comes to get you, because otherwise it could be the guy. And then they eventually got him, and so we were able to, like, leave our house. And then we walked over, because I lived two minutes, and the middle school all got out, and they were all, like, crying and stuff, because all their siblings go to, the Doug like, Douglas. And um, then all the Douglas kids were all just everywhere, because they kind of just let them out, too. And everyone was just terrified the whole day. And we still didn't know, like, where anybody was that was missing until we realized what, like, missing probably meant. And then, yeah, the rest of the day was just really, like, I don't know, it was just really anxious the whole day. I understand. Um, let, let's move up a little bit more so people can, can you hear? It needs to be a little louder, Alex. And um, what did I tell you um, all day long? It's slow. Oh, sorry. Speak a little bit slower. Um, it's, and, then, and then I said, when you come tonight, especially go slower. So I'm just going to keep asking you to go a little bit slower okay. so that everyone can hear. But thank you for taking us through that day. Um, earlier today, Mia, you shared a little bit with us about some of the drills that they'd done at school. And in, and in fact, they'd just done some sort of lockdown drill like two weeks ago. And you had said that that, that was actually really helpful because you guys knew how to respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a week or two before, all the teachers had like a meeting to tell us where to hide if something happened. And we started going over drills for fire drills for everything. So every teacher, every period would talk about every drill and tell you where to hide if something were to happen or what to do if you were in the bathroom or in the hallway. You talked about texting your friends and trying to check in and see if everybody was okay. And of course, we found out that not everybody was okay. Um, and I know it's hard to talk about your friends, but I wanted you each to share a little bit about um, friends whom you lost. And Haley, I know you were close with Jamie Gutenberg, um, who was a dancer, and I know that you're a dancer. Can you tell us a little bit about Jamie and about your relationship with her, what she was like as a person and how you guys got to know each other? Um, well, our moms have known each other for, I don't like, eight years probably. So I've known her and her brother, who's in our grade. And she was just such like a beautiful person, an amazing dancer. I don't even know how she was able to move like that. And her smile, like when, you, when she walked in the room, that's the first thing you saw, because she was just really bubbly and like always happy. And she always helped like everybody with anything. I don't know, she was just a really good person. When was the last time that you danced together, the last time that you saw her? Um, well, this year in dance, usually when I'm leaving, she fr she's first coming in. So probably the last time I saw her was the Wednesday before while she was walking in. And when did you hear that, that she didn't survive the attack? Um, since I'm friends with her brother, I kept texting him like every five minutes, like, did you hear from her yet? Did you hear from her? And then finally he goes, no, she didn't make it. And I, I was like, how do you know that? Because no other family knew yet. And they have a friend that's on the SWAT team that went in looking for her and sadly found her. Mia, you were close with Nicholas Dwarit. Can you tell us a little bit about him and, and your friendship? He was the most amazing person you'd ever meet. He always had a smile on his face. He would walk into class happy. It was chemistry, like no one's really happy in that class. And he would, and he would walk in and he would He was make happy them, in chemistry class. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> and he would walk in, he would make the class actually fun to go to. And he always, he sat next to me, so we would always talk and joke around. And our lab groups would always work together and we would always get separated because we were always too loud. But then, like, I don't know, he was just an amazing person, like the sweetest person you'd ever meet. And he was definitely going to the Olympics for swimming. And he had just such a bright future behind him, ahead of him. Yeah. Today you were telling me about um, Joaquin. Oh, uh, yeah, I was saying, like, even if you didn't know him, because, like, I wasn't close with him, but I still knew him. Like, the whole school knew him. He went to every game of every sport, cheered on the school everywhere, always walked around, like, smiling and talking to everybody, just... If you, even if you didn't know him, you still knew him. Like, he was such a good person. And um, what about some of the faculty? I know that um, one of your coaches um, was really loved by students, and, and he didn't survive that day. Can you tell us a little bit about I didn't him? really know him, but everyone always said that he was the sweetest person you'd ever meet, and that he was just an amazing person. Obviously, you can see that now. He's a hero and saved many lives. Um, 
Well, when I used to like walk into school last year, because I'd go in by the senior lot, he was always sitting there on his golf cart, waving good morning to everybody, and now there's like cops there instead. But, and people also don't know him and Coach Hickson both did the same thing. They both walked in together, not armed, trying to save people. And I don't know, I feel like Hickson isn't really getting as much like credit for it, but they're both heroes. So you, you said that you know where you used to have a, a coach smiling and waving, now there's a police presence. Earlier today you talked a little bit about how safe Parkland used to feel to you. And I know when I talked to Melissa, um, she described the community um, right on the edge of the Everglades uh, and your really idyllic um, small town feel. Can you say a little bit about what the school used to feel like in that regard? and what the community felt like? I know it's changed so much, but can you give us a sense of what that felt like? I mean, it was voted the safest city in Florida like a week before it. And I don't know, it just, it was my home since fifth grade. And it just felt, I mean, at school before that, I wasn't scared for my safety. I didn't feel scared. I didn't feel like my school was unsafe. But now it's just different. Well, Nobody really thought it would happen at our school, especially all the other schools around. Like, they all thought Douglas is like, oh, they're all rich and they're all like, whatever, but we're not. But, um, <laughs> like, I don't know. Nobody really thought it would happen there. And nobody really had to worry about if we can walk in the hallways and still make it to the next class period alive. But now we do. Um, and I know just this week there was a student brought a knife to school. Um, Two of them. Apparently, so that they could defend themselves. Um, but now you're gonna have to have uh, see-through backpacks? Yeah, two students brought knives on the same day. Mm -hmm. The media presence has been very intense. Um, can you say a little bit about what that's been like? Um, you know, teenagers just trying to cope with a tragedy and the eyes of the world are upon you. This week's Time Magazine, if you haven't seen the cover of it, five uh, students, from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School are on the cover. Um, you've been now on, on the news. What's that been like having the media uh, surrounding you? The first day back, it was really hard because walking from the junior lot, they were on both sides of you. And it's like a, not like a small sidewalk, but it's not big enough for all of us to stand there. So we had to like huddle through and like push through them because they didn't give us any space to breathe. And we're just trying to go back to school and it, they just made it really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a lot of us had like panic attacks for the first couple of days because there's cameras just like, if you walk, there was a camera here, a microphone here, and you'd like duck under them. And they wouldn't, they don't like understand no. But like, I know that kids are like, they're speaking out and stuff now. But at the same time, like we need to be able to just not be bombarded. The eyes of the world are on you and in some ways the weight of the world too, everyone's um, in some ways looking to, to you for leadership, and that's, think about the responsibility of just coping um, with uh, the tragedy that you've been through. Um, I, I know you were at over a dozen funerals, I think, each of you, um, over a period of maybe a week. Yeah, the 17 funerals were probably in about like a week, week and a half maybe. There was like five in one day, or like three, like, I try to go to as many as I can, but it's hard going from one funeral to another to another. Like, it's hard. And they're all people that you either knew well or were, were acquaintances with. It, it's not like strangers. Yeah, well, some of them, like, I didn't know at all, but I still went because they still went to our school. Like, we all still are connected in some way. Yeah, you didn't have to know them personally to go. When you would show up, there would be, like, a thousand people there just from the community, from the school. Everyone just came to support. It's, I'm sure it's, it's happening every day, but, but how has this experience changed you? What are some things that you notice um, about yourselves that's, that's different because of what you went through on February 14th and everything you've been through in the month that's passed? Oh, I'm not taking anything for granted anymore. And I'm just not getting mad at anything anymore because you never know when the last time you're going to see that person is. So an argument isn't going to solve anything and every morning now I wake my dad up before I go to school and say bye because I used to just leave to go because it would be like six no seven in the morning so he wouldn't be up so yeah
Yeah, like every morning, because my dad usually sits at the computer, like on Facebook or whatever. So now he turns around, and he says, like, bye, Haley. Like, he has to make sure that he sees me. And yeah, you don't take anything for granted anymore, especially your friends. You keep them close and make sure that you're never mad for anything. Like, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Now, we know you're not policy experts and you're not elected officials, but you've certainly been thinking a lot about this over the last month and you've been asked about it. And from your perspective as, as teenagers who've lived through one of the most horrific, devastating events that, that we could imagine and the aftermath and the pressure and the media and all those kinds of things, what would you like to see changed as you are entering adulthood on the cusp of being able to vote what are, what are some changes you'd like to see happen? What would you like us to think about maybe differently? I think stricter gun laws should be made because an 18-year-old should not be able to buy an AR-15. And I think there should be safer schools. There shouldn't be one cop at every school. We have like 3,300 kids and we had one police officer. So that's like, there needs to be safer schools. There needs to be gates, like closed lock security sitting outside. Like it, there needs to be a change. When we drove up to Shauhevet today, um, there's an armed guard and a giant fence, and, and they both commented on that. They said that's, that's not, how it, it's not how it was at their school. Yeah. How about you, well, there's, Haley? There's like so many entrances to our school because it's so big, and nobody really had to worry before about, like, oh, is somebody that's not supposed to be here going to come in and do something? And now I think there definitely needs to be more like, protection and more security but I don't think that they should give teachers guns because you don't fight guns with more guns. So. <laughs> you made some friends today. Um, and tell me about that because we were, we were trying to leave Shall Have It and they, I couldn't find them. And, um, <laughs> And we had to get to uh, De Toledo, and I had told them, I was like, this is, this is a ways. It's only like nine miles, but it'll take us an hour. We really got to go. And then they were gone, and then I found out that you've made some new friends. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, they were just there with open arms, welcoming us, talking to us. They were just there supporting us and smiling and telling us how amazing we are, and it just felt so nice to get all the support. Yeah, we were about to leave, and I just had to go to the bathroom. But then they kind of like went in there at the same time, like four of them. And then as soon as I was done going to the bathroom, they started talking to us. And then they kept us in there for a good 15 minutes. <laughs> and we got all their numbers and everything because they wanted to get like Douglas shirts to help like donate money. And so, and then one of them wrote a song too and sung it for us, and it was so sweet. You mentioned some of the things that people are doing to try to help your high school. You mentioned um, a classmate who is, who's still in the hospital. Um, yeah, and yeah. there's a fund that's been set up to, to try to help his family with medical bills. What are some of the ways that we can help um, in, in those concrete ways? There are a lot of GoFundMe pages for the victims and their families, and especially for Anthony, who is fighting for his life right now because he saved his whole class. What's Anthony's last name? Vulgar. I don't know. Something with a B. Borgus, yeah, I don't know how to say it. And we, yeah. can, we can put that GoFundMe uh, page up. Uh, Rabbi Stern can help us with that. Yeah. Um, this morning, um, and full disclosure, we did ask Haley and Mia, we said maybe you could include in your, um, in your words to the students at these Jewish high schools something from our Jewish tradition, and you did it beautifully. Um, I remember it was the thing about hope and freedom. So, um, <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit about your Passover teaching? that you shared uh, with the students today? Um, well, because Moses helped free the slaves, <laughs> and now we're getting a chance to like, have the freedom of our speech and get to tell everybody our story and how they should make a change and not just sit around and do nothing about it. We also talked about hope and how we should all have hope that things are going to get better. They may be really tough right now, but we'll eventually get better if we stay together and we all have hope and believe that everything's going to be okay. Well, um, we're so grateful to you. We're going to have a beautiful um, Oneg outside, and we have a special surprise for you at the Oneg. Um, and so uh, we want 
people to have an opportunity to say hello to Mia and Haley. If you're coming on the bus with us tomorrow, then you'll get to be on the bus with, with our special guests and uh, the keynote speakers at the uh, March for Our Lives here in Los Angeles. Um, and we hope that this will uh, be a friendship that, uh, that develops between Kol Tikva, between Parkland and Stephen Wise Temple and uh, the Los Angeles community. I'm grateful to the Kaplan family, members of our temple who helped make your trip possible. Um, and I'm grateful to the entire community who've been so incredibly supportive. Um, one thing that I was curious about um, as part of our conversation today is who Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was. And um, the internet is not just great for finding colleagues in Parkland, Florida, and all sorts of other things, but um, does anyone here know who Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was? She is one of the great environmentalists of the 20th century. She single-handedly put the preservation of the Everglades on the map. She lived to be 108 years old. And one thing that I think is really important and I want to end with, because you both said this several times today, she was, because she was born in 1890, lived to 1998, a pretty good run. Um, <laughs> She was a women's suffrage advocate. When she was born, women couldn't vote. Can you imagine such a thing? And then she uh, helped participate in a movement that made it possible for women to vote. So what did you say time and time again today to all the high school students? Vote. Make sure to register to vote if you want to see change. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.